Hi everybody, I finally got round again to having another look at my electronic DC load project. I had a lot of feedback on this uh, and some of that I will come to later. But today I'm going to focus on two things. I'm going to have another look at the uh, output uh, power MOSFETs and how we can improve the reliability of those and try and give some protection in the event of them uh, overheating and going into thermal runaway. I'm also going to take the opportunity to tidy up the wiring around those MOSFETs. Remember we had those uh, 0.1 ohm ballast resistors hanging around the, the MOSFET. Let's see if we can tidy that up as well. And the second thing I'm going to do is finish off the transient mode, the, the trigger input circuit. Uh, I'm going to go through the design of the, the circuit itself for the trigger input and then build that. And we'll have a look at testing that and uh, doing the setup or adjusting that uh, part of the circuit. So let's go ahead and have a look at those two things. Well the first thing I'm going to do is have a look at the changes I've made to try to improve the stability of the uh, power MOSFETs and trying to present the possibility of it going, any one of them going into thermal runaway. You'll recall on uh, one of my previous videos on this project uh, we discussed this and we said that uh, although the on resistance of the MOSFET had a positive temperature coefficient which had some form of balancing uh, for the different MOSFETs. Uh, in opposition to that the gate source voltage to the junction temperature had a negative temperature coefficient which could make matters worse. Now you never get two MOSFETs to be identical there's always going to be slight differences and therefore if you apply the same gate source voltage, the threshold voltage, to any two power MOSFETs, one will always conduct slightly more than the other. And that causes rise to the possibility of one of the MOSFETs then drawing more current. As it draws more current, it gets hotter. As it gets hotter, the gate source threshold voltage requirement reduces. If you maintain the previous gate threshold voltage, then it's driving it harder, so it gets hotter still and eventually it'll go into what we call thermal runaway as it gets too hot and then uh, eventually the, the, the MOSFET is damaged and useless. So to try and prevent that uh, we did introduce that additional 0.1 ohm resistor, the ballast resistor we added uh, and you'll see them here uh, and that did actually improve it and work quite well uh, but I found in, in practice that uh, to get the best results of that you, although I put a 0.1 ohm resistor, ballast resistor in there for those uh, that effect, uh, it actually works better if you increase the resistance slightly to either 1 or 2 ohms. But the problem of that is that it detracts them from the way the circuit operates. So you want to try and keep that value of resistor as low as possible, whilst at the same time giving some form of protection in the event of any one of the MOSFETs conducting harder than the other and going into the possibility of thermal runaway. So what I'm going to do today is have a look at a different method, or let's say an improved method, of trying to overcome that by having some active feedback to control the gate source uh, threshold voltage of the individual MOSFETs. Now we're still going to leave the 0.1 ohm resistor in there, these ballast resistors that we added, uh, but this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a NPN transistor and uh, widen this format and the intention is that uh, as the voltage across these uh, resistors here increases it provides a bias voltage for that NPN transistor which then conducts. And what we're going to do is take the emitter return of the transistor through a limiting resistor to our negative 5 volt supply. And by doing that uh, we can then use this small uh, voltage coming in here from the sense resistors to effectively drive that transistor and give some form of uh, biasing there that then when the transistor starts to conduct it dra drags the, ba the gate voltage of the MOSFET down and as it drags the gate voltage down 
the it cuts off the current flow a little bit through the MOSFET so you've got some self balancing there. So this little circuit here with just the addition of one transistor provides a, an active feedback loop effectively amplifying the effect of that little 0.1 ohm balanced resistor sorry balanced resistor there and uh, simply bringing down the gate uh, source voltage in the event of this particular MOSFET uh, getting too hot and conducting more than the others. And I'm going to apply that same principle on each of the other three MOSFETs, so all four MOSFETs will have that arrangement and uh, we'll take the uh, the emitter down to our negative uh, supply. We do actually have, remember, a negative voltage supply which we used on our uh, sense input circuit to measure the voltage, the voltage sense circuit. So I'm going to use that to, to supply that negative voltage and probably put something like a 47k resistor there, fairly large value resistor because we have low current. And the other thing I'm also going to have to do is this 100 ohm resistor which was feeding the gate of the MOSFET in order that this arrangement doesn't then affect the other three MOSFETs. I'm going to increase the value of that 100 ohm resistor to a 2.2K. And that particular arrangement is then going to improve the stability of these uh, four MOSFETs and uh, improve the overall performance of the circuit in the event of anyone getting a little bit too hot. So let's have a look at the uh, full circuit of this. Here we have the uh, full uh, circuit diagram of the changes that I'm proposing here on the output stage of the power MOSFETs. I'll make this available as a download as well. Uh, there you can see we've got the four power MOSFETs uh, wired the same as we had previously. Uh, the gate drive to each of those MOSFETs is driven by these four resistors here. Uh, originally they were, as I said, 100 ohm. We've, we've increased them to 2.2K. And uh, we still have those four 0.1 ohm ballasting resistors there to try and improve the performance. So they're, they're staying and they're all returned down to ground through the current sense resistor R17. Um, I've got their optional position because uh, I'm going to produce a little printed circuit board for this. Uh, also to tidy up the wiring of the components to these power MOSFETs. I'll show you that in a second. Uh, there we have the four NPN transistors. I'm using a small uh, signal uh, sort of switching uh, transistor there, the 2N2222A uh, in my case, but you can use any sort of general purpose little transistor there. And the emitters are joined together. That's then going through a 47K resistor and we're feeding that with minus 5 volts and that's coming from the negative 5 volt supply on the little voltage uh, sense, remote sense module that we built earlier. So there's the uh, the circuit, the full circuit and as I say what we're going to do is, we're, I'm going to produce that on a, a, a printed circuit board, here's a, a new little PCB that I've made for this particular purpose and uh, we're going to tidy up the, uh, the, the feed uh, components to the uh, MOSFET transistors, particularly all those uh, large uh, ballasting resistors there as well. They're all now going to go on this PCB. You'll see, you'll see that shortly. Here we now see the new little printed circuit board with all the components mounted. You can clearly see the, the large 0.1 ohm ballast resistors there which are going to the source of each of the MOSFETs. And uh, there's the four uh, transistors and in between the large ballast resistors there we've got the 2.2k resistors which are driving the gate of the MOSFETs. The little resistor here at the end is the 47k which is then the other end is fed through that grey wire there that goes to the negative 5 volt supply and the yellow lead coming down here to the main PCB is going to the uh, gate drive voltage on the main printed circuit board. Now I've positioned the height of this such that it's as close as possible to the uh, power MOSFETs which means that these connecting wires are very short but I've also ensured that the you see the brown wires there that are feeding the source of each of the MOSFETs. I'm using heavy gauge wire there for that particular purpose. 
the gate wires can be lower gauge, that's the yellow wire. So there's the, uh, the new module in place and uh, it does seem to work quite well. The, uh, at the end there you've got a little blue wire there, that's going to the 0.1 ohm uh, sense resistor which is still on the heatsink. Now we have got on this printed circuit board provision to have the sense resistor mounted on the board. So I've, I've made provision for that on the on the board itself, but in, in my case I'm still using the one on the heatsink. And also, if you wanted to, you could mount the power transistor directly onto this PCB and then bolt them straight onto a heatsink. So there's that option there as well. So it's, it's down to yourselves on that. So there we are, that's the, uh, the changes that I've made there. Right, well now let's have a look at the trigger input circuit I've designed for this project. Basically what I wanted to do is have a trigger input that was fully isolated from the DC load itself, giving some protection, and at the same time giving us some means of uh, shaping the pulse for a narrowish pulse, a nice clean pulse. And remember that for this DC load we need to supply it with a negative pulse to trigger the transient mode. So let's have a look at the circuit I've put together for this. Right, well here we have the uh, full uh, circuit of the trigger input that I proposed today. And uh, the first thing you'll notice is that uh, the isolation that I require is provided by this optocoupler, the 4N25, which uh, employs a light emitting a diode and a phototransistor. And this is giving us complete isolation between the input from the BNC socket and the rest of the circuitry on the DC load. So if we apply on the BNC socket there a positive pulse, goes via a 100 ohm limiting resistor and is then applied across the photodiode there, which then emits infrared light to turn on the phototransistor and the output there. You'll also notice across the uh, photodiode on pins one and two, I've got a small signal diode, the 1N4148, uh, and that is wired there in such a way that if you happen to get a large negative spike or pulse on the input, it prevents any damage to the photodiode inside the IC. Now the output uh, here is the phototransistor. Uh, it's got three connections on the output, but we're not using the base connection, so that's left uh, unconnected. The connections there from pin 5, the collector is going to plus 5 volts and the emitter is going down to ground through the 47k resistor. So whenever we apply a positive pulse on the input, at the BNC socket there, we also get a positive pulse on the output of the optocoupler at pin 4, and uh, it's that pulse that is then going to be fed into a differentiator circuit there, which is formed by the 1 microfarad uh, ceramic capacitor there, and a 500k uh, preset resistor. And by adjusting the timing of that CR circuit there, we can affect the output signal, uh, which you see there, that's the differentiated pulse that's coming out. So we've got a, a positive and a negative pulse coming out. When the pulse there coming out of the optocoupler goes high, the other side of the capacitor suddenly goes high to that maximum amount and then dies away as the capacitor charges and then as it receives the negative pulse at the input the opposite happens uh, and it dies down negative and then as the capacitor charges in the opposite direction it then gradually dies away. So that particular pulse there the shape of that is determined by the CR time constant of those two components and by adjusting the 500k preset in fact, what we do is we alter the shape of that output signal. So what you'll find is that you could have a very sharp output signal like that, or you could have a more shallow one if the time constant is longer. So you could have something like that. And what we're going to do today is adjust the preset there to give us a narrow pulse, which we're then going to feed into the input of a inverting uh, Schmidt trigger at uh, pin one there of that particular chip. So what we're doing now is we've got this particular IC here which is a dual 
inverting Smith trigger, it's the 74 LVC2 G14. It's very similar to the standard 7414 ICs, which has uh, uh, six Schmidt trigger non inverted, uh, sorry, inverting Schmidt triggers inside it. But I chose this particular IC because it's very low power consumption compared with the uh, standard 7414. And uh, also, it only has two inverters, Schmidt trigger inverters inside it. Uh, whereas if I were to use a standard IC, then uh, that would have six inverters in there. And we'd have to ensure that the other four that we don't use are all uh, uh, grounded to stop them interfering. But in this case, I'm using this dual uh, Schmidt trigger inverter, uh, which suits our purposes ideally because it's uh, extremely low current and uh, very fast switching as well. So the output from the Schmidt trigger is coming out of pin 6 at that point there, and that's what we feed to A2 on our Arduino Nano as our negative going uh, pulse. And the width of that pulse is determined by the time constant of this integrated circuit here. And we'll be adjusting the preset to give us a pulse width there of around 200 milliseconds. Now I've also used the second inverting Schmidt trigger inside this IC to give us an output to feed an oscilloscope when we're testing it. Uh, and that will give us a positive pulse because we're taking the output there feeding it onto the input there inverts again so we get a positive pulse there so we can monitor that on the oscilloscope while adjusting that and at the same time we can have the output connected to the Arduino Nano. Now on the output of the inverter there at pin 6 I also have a pull up resistor at 10k there and this is to present, uh, prevent any spurious pulses or interference spikes getting to the Arduino and causing erratic triggering so that uh, pull-up resistor will, will prevent that. And the other thing I've added is on the input of the inverting Schmidt trigger at pin 1 I've got a 10k resistor going to a test point there, another test pin there, and between those two if we short them out we pull pin 1 high to plus 5 volts causing the output to go low. And that's just a test button to test that the Schmidt trigger pulse is working correctly we can test it manually by putting a button across there and just shotting out those two pins and it'll give us a negative trigger pulse going to our DC load. So there we have it, there's the uh, trigger input circuitry. Uh, a couple of capacitors there on the uh, 5 volt line near the chip to give some decoupling, so you've got a 10 microfarad and a 0.1. Uh, but other than that you can see it's quite a simple little circuit and uh, I'm going to produce that on a small printed circuit board which will be mounted inside the uh, DC load. So let's have a look at the uh, printed circuit board that I've got for this uh, trigger circuit. Here we have the printed circuit board for the uh, trigger input circuit now which I've made, a little small module which will mount in the, uh, in the case. Uh, let's have a look at the, this board now when all the components are mounted. There we have the board now with the components mounted uh, there's the connector that goes to the BNC uh, socket on the back, the trigger input socket there's the opto coupler IC which is pluggable and the little preset you've got there is the one for altering the, the pulse width and the pin connections here are for connecting the power, the plus and, uh, 5 volts, the output pin is there we've got a two test pins there where we can put that to a push button if you wanted to test the circuit and there's two other pins here which we can feed to an oscilloscope. So that's the module. The main components are actually on the surface mount on the other side of the uh, module so let me just turn it round. Well there we have the reverse side of the module with all the surface mount components mounted. Uh, you can see all the capacitors and the little surface mount resistors and the little tiny chip there you can see it's a 6 pin SOC 23 uh, that is actually the uh, dual uh, Schmidt trigger inverter chip there just got two of those Schmidt triggers on that chip um, and uh, it's, although it's very very small you just need to take a little bit of care when you're soldering that onto the board and make sure you don't get the uh, 
the contacts there shorting across to each other. If need be, use a bit of solder wick to make sure that you draw away any excess solder. Here we have a close-up view of the print of the board, just quickly, uh, just so you can see the uh, little IC there, the 23 six-pin chip there. Uh, and uh, on the PCB I put a little dot where pin 1 is, which is in that corner there. Here's just a quick view of the, the way I've mounted the trigger input socket, the BNC socket on the back of the, uh, the unit and also the little power, DC power socket there as well. That's mounted onto a, a either it can either be a plastic uh, strip as long as it's insulated. In my particular case I used a, a bit of old printed circuit board which I stripped off the copper so I'm just using the, the board without the copper and uh, just mounted that then onto the heatsink and then I've got my two sockets there. That's then wired through, the BNC wired through to the uh, trigger input circuitry there on that board and then the power jack is then going to the on-off switch and the, and the main board. Here we now see just an overview of all the uh, modules wired together. So the main printed circuit board with the little clock module there on top and the Arduino Nano. There's the remote uh, sense module. Uh, at the back there you've got now the uh, the new module there which is providing the drive with the protection circuit on for the power MOSFETs and then down in that corner there we've got the trigger input circuitry there going to a BNC socket on the back. Now the other thing I've changed is you'll notice we've got instead of having a lot of the wires soldered into the main printed circuit board I've now uh, added some little JST sockets there so all these sockets now have been added uh, to make it easier to unplug and, and reconnect the board if you make any changes. And basically what I've done, I've used these little tiny um, little tiny sockets that you can buy quite cheaply and then you just simply need to have the, the, the wiring on the plug there and going to your other module. So that works out quite nicely. Um, I've also, on the remote sense module there, I drilled another hole there and then wired that to the negative 5 volt supply. It's a little pin there which we then use for the uh, the output board here to the power MOSFETs. And uh, you'll also notice that the feed wire coming from the remote sense, this grey wire here, I've used some screen cable there to prevent any noise. So that's another change that I made on the, uh, on the sort of uh, wiring arrangement. We're now going to have a go at uh, setting up the uh, trigger input circuitry here. I've got the oscilloscope, as you can see there, connected to the two test pin pins on the uh, board. And the preset there, we're going to adjust that to give us a trigger pulse of around about uh, 200 to 250 uh, milliseconds. Now, if you don't have access to a signal generator to give you that sort of uh, pulse signal, or you don't have access to an oscilloscope, then I've designed the circuit in such a way that if you adjust the preset so it's exactly in its midway point, it'll give you round about 200 milliseconds. So uh, it'll be certainly adequate for uh, this uh, DC load. But we're going to have a go now setting up using the generator and monitoring the pulse on the oscilloscope. We're now going to have a look at setting the pulse width of the trigger input circuitry uh, to between 2 to 300 uh, milliseconds. And what I have here is I've got a signal generator here which is giving us a pulse at the moment, a 1 second pulse with a 50-50 duty cycle. Uh, the oscilloscope uh, time base is set to 100 milliseconds. So each square there is a hundred milliseconds width, and I've got the scope connected to the uh, terminals on the uh, trigger input circuitry, as I indicated on the uh, circuit diagram. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch the uh, signal generator on and monitor the width of the pulse on the oscilloscope. So here we have the moment you can see it'll probably refresh, its time base is running very slow, it's refreshing 
I'll just increase it down. So if you look at the moment, you'll see that the pulse width there is just over one square, so it's just over 100 milliseconds. So we need to adjust the preset to so we fill two squares, and that'll be around 200 milliseconds. Maybe just take it slightly over that. So if I adjust that uh, preset now. As you adjust it, because of the time base is running very, very slow, you just have to wait a second or so for it to update. So I'll turn the, the preset. You can see the pulse width is now increasing. There we go. So that's set at uh, 200 uh, milliseconds. I'm just going to set it 250. There we go. So there you can see that on the oscilloscope the pulse width there is two and a half squares, so that's 250 milliseconds. That is now set. And what we'll do now is we'll test that on the uh, DC load on the pulse mode. So we can see what's happening. I've uh, set the frequency generator now to give us a pulse out at uh, six seconds, a six second pulse. This is the period I've got there. Uh, so we slowed it right down so we can, we can see the effect on the DC load. I'm now going to go into the uh, transient mode pressing the A button and the button on the rotary encoder and I'm now going to select number 3 for pulse. Uh, I'm going to set the low current to 0 and the high current to 1 amp and the time I'm going to set at a thousand milliseconds, that's one second there we are Right, well I have the uh, DC load now running in pulse mode, pulse transient mode. Uh, it's being fed with a, a pulse every six seconds. And uh, what I've done, I've just uh, adjusted the time base on the oscilloscope to uh, one second. So we can see the pulses once every six seconds. So you can see on the oscilloscope we're receiving a pulse every six seconds which is triggering the DC load. Once it's triggered it turns on for one second to one amp and then goes back down to zero. I've now set the uh, signal generator to give us a three second pulse so you'll see the rate now has doubled there on the oscilloscope uh, but the electronic load is still set to give us one amp load every time we receive a pulse. So you can see here that the one amp load there is toggling. goes high for one amp for a second and then goes low for two seconds before then toggling back high again. So you can see the pulse there now controlling the DC load. Well I'm going to leave the project there for today. Uh, I covered off what I wanted to do today. Uh, what I will do is I'll give you a couple of links down below where you can uh, download the artwork for these two additional little PCBs, the schematics and the parts list for them. In addition to that I did uh, make one or two changes and improvements to the software so I'll give you the latest version of software as well. Now I'd also like to thank all my viewers for the kind comments and good suggestions that I've had. Uh, really lots of good feedback on this particular project and quite a few people I understand are having a go at building it which is quite nice. Uh, and just uh, just recently I had some very detailed comments coming from uh, Kenneth Larverson. Uh, he's actually built the project and taken it to a much higher power level by using a power linear MOSFET although they're quite expensive to buy. I think uh, he said the one he bought was around £24. 
Uh, but nevertheless, it just proves the point that you can upgrade this particular project uh, for your own particular needs. Now what I will do is, uh, there's one or two little loose ends that I need to cover off. I found uh, one or two little uh, glitches here and there. Uh, the fan control uh, I need to have another look at. Uh, I've noticed that when the fan comes on, uh, it has been affecting very slightly the voltage reading on the LCD display. So I need to have a look at that. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, if you found this of interest, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe. And I'll see you all again soon next time. Bye for now.